Okay, well, ladies, welcome to session two of Bless. So let's open in a word of prayer and we'll jump in on this gorgeous, cold sunny day. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for giving us another day of life in which we can get to know you and to see you act on our behalf and on behalf of other people. Another day when we can look into your word and Father, just open our hearts to you. Draw our minds in. We all come in with things on our mind, to-do lists, and many things. And we just pray that you help us to leave those things and to come to your word and just give us a treasured time of fellowship together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, we, <clears throat> I ask you to look at Galatians. And to circle the word gospel on that sheet. Sheet, and I ask you to circle the word gospel on your homework. So I just want to get fresh in our minds again. We use the word gospel in two different ways. <coughs> the first way is it's a written account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. It's a biography, if you will. And even though I know you know this, um, you know, there's four of them. Why do you think God chose four biographies of his son? Thoughts on that? It's different. People look at things different ways mm -hmm. and see different. I mean, yes, for people to tell you uh, an account of something they saw, and they're all going to say it's a little different. Okay, mm -hmm. definitely that. Mm -hmm. And I think God wanted to give us as complete a picture as He mm -hmm. could of His Son. I thought, think of it this way. Let's take a person like George Washington, okay? Mm -hmm. And four hypothetical biographies written mm -hmm. about him. One by his son. Tom said, did he have children? I said, I don't know, but. This is hypothetical. Okay, so one by his son, one by an officer serving under him during the Revolutionary War, one by his wife, and one by a slave that he had. You would get four very different accounts. Same man, he's the same character, quality, if you will, across the board, but four very different perspectives of his life. And Together, they would give you a more complete picture of how this man related to people around him. So, anyhow, we have four Gospels. But we also use the word Gospel. Uh, I tried to think of a concise definition. It's a statement of the components of saving faith. Mm -hmm. What do you have to believe mm -hmm. to really trust in Christ? And Paul left us in no doubt. Yes. <laughs> if you, uh, the most concise one I can think of is in 1 Corinthians 15. So I'm just going to read parts of verses 1 to 4. And he's talking to the Corinthians. He says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Don't talk about that. Are being saved. Mm -hmm. You were saved eternally, but you're still being saved in the sense that God is sanctifying us. He's delivering us from this present evil age. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Anyway, I wanted to remind you of this gospel. I preached it. You received it. You're standing firm. That's the foundation for your faith. You're being saved. And I delivered to you as of first importance what I received by revelation from Christ, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The death, the burial, the resurrection, that is the gospel, if you will. And Paul over and over makes sure that people are very clear about that. And in fact, so that brings us to Galatians. And I ask you to underline a couple of things. I ask you to underline <clears throat> who raised us from the dead and who gave himself for our sins. What do those two phrases have to do with? The gospel. The gospel. <laughs> yeah. The resurrection. God raised him from the dead. The substitutionary death. He died for our sins. Okay, so even when he doesn't use the word gospel, he certainly mm -hmm. refers to it in many ways. So, you know, he just let, he's talking about the gospel right from get go in this book. And then I ask you to underline or double underline a couple of other things um, to deliver us from the present evil age 
and their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I ask you to underline those two things because again, in 1 Corinthians, he says you are being saved by this gospel. It's affecting your life. And he says, so here he says somewhat the same thing. He's delivering us from this present evil age. And someday we'll be totally delivered from this present evil age and never even be in the presence of sin anymore. But then he also talks about another group of people who unfortunately they, they have tried to distort the gospel and they aren't being delivered. Their conduct isn't in line with the truth of the gospel. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But the last thing I asked you to do was to think to, as you read through this and you noticed those things, what purpose or purpose says do you think Paul had in mind in writing this letter? Yeah, you just put in all to remind them to come back to the truth. Okay, come back to the truth. Not man's gospel, but Jesus' gospel. Okay, it's not man's gospel, it's God's idea and his implementation. Yeah. The gospel trumps the traditions of the law. Oh, gospel trumps tradition. I like that. Alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> I also had that it applied whether Jew or Gentile. Okay. This is true God-inspired inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter what your background, he wants to bring you in with the gospel. So the main reason Paul was, he was emphasizing it is because he was so disturbed that they would leave that. Right, and, right. And, and get bogged down in something that wasn't. You saw he used some very strong language in this account. Um, so, anybody else have anything else you want to add to that before we go on? Well, oh, oh, I was going to say, he wanted to leave them in no doubt. <laughs> that's, that's what I put. Yep, absolutely no doubt. So that brings us to the new worksheet, the one that has the blue box at the top. And I made a fill in the blank just to help with taking notes for that. Um, you notice up on the little blue box in 10 words or less, I got that from that Know Your Bible book, that Christians are free from restrictive Jewish laws. As you were kind of reading through this, what kind of restrictive Jewish law in particular were they dealing with in Galatia? Circumcision. Circumcision, mm -hmm. yep. You know, for thousands of years, Jewish people have been told, be circumcised, be circumcised, be circumcised. And you're going to be cut off from your people if you're not. And so some people felt, okay, these Gentile believers are coming in, they have to be circumcised. Okay. So, with that as a backdrop, here are some purposes I thought Paul might have had in mind to correct false teaching. And by that, any distortion of the true gospel. You know, the true gospel, you know, trusting in the death, burial, and resurrect resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you add circumcision, you've distorted it. You've added some man's work to Christ's finished work. Okay? And he had these different descriptions of what a false gospel looks like. In verse 6, he calls it a different gospel. Hey, this is not the one I preached to you. I thought this is a different one. You know what I thought about? You ever have Jehovah's Witness or oh, yeah. Mormons come? What do they always try to emphasize? See, we use the Bible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're the same. We're the same. We're the same. Uh huh. Not when you examine it. Different, different, different. And we need to be aware of differences. They are important. He says this is a different gospel. Not the real thing. He calls it a distorted gospel. Um, any of you guys, or any of your husbands, or if you try to do some work around the house, if you have a distorted object, it's hard to work with it. In Bangladesh, um, <laughs> one of our friends was doing some repair work and he needed some screws. So he went to the little local hardware and got some screws. The slots were not in the center. 
Have you ever oh, tried to wow. turn a screw? <laughs> it's hard enough to do it on the center. <laughs> off to one side. It was distorted and pretty useless, actually. He was from New Zealand. God. Simply God. Jesus. <laughs> 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 screws. Um, down in verses 8 and 9, he says, it's a gospel contrary. It's opposite. It's not, you know, contrary to the one that Paul preached. And we already looked to see what that was in 1 Corinthians 15. And then as Bonnie, I think it was, said, it's man's gospel. Man's ideas tacked on, not God's plan. So, okay, so his first, or I shouldn't say his first, but one of his objects was to correct all that false thinking. And then he also, the next dot down, he wanted to warn of the consequences of preaching a false gospel. And this is where he really is strong in his language. Um, if you look at verse 8, but even if we, if I come back to you and I'm not preaching what I used to preach, let me be accursed or of an angel. I mean, who would not believe an angel? If an angel preaches something different, let him be accursed. And again, in the next verse, I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a different gospel, then let him be accursed. You're coming under the curse of God. Mm -hmm. The same God that said to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you, said, I will curse those that curse you, that bring you something that will destroy your life or harm your life. This is, this is scary as a business. You know? mm -hmm. So he warned of the consequences of that. Why are you abandoning it? You're putting yourself in danger, people. You need to get back to the truth. And then the next stop down, he wanted to direct the conduct of certain believers. Not These weren't unbelievers. They were, were fellow brothers you know, in the faith. And in fact, one we know quite well, Peter and so and Barnabas. These are big name people, big name with the gospel, but their conduct was out of line here. And then the last one was he says that the gospel sanctifies believers in the midst of great evil. And that was that quote um, to deliver us from this present evil age. So, the principle is that false thinking leads to wrong conduct every single time. Your thinking gets off, your actions are going to be off because we act with, in accordance with what we believe. Okay, and then, so here's a specific example of Peter. Now, let's pick up, let's see. Okay, we'll pick up with the last paragraph on the last page here, verse 11. When Cephas, that's Peter, when he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face <laughs> because he stood condemned, or he stood blamed, he was to be blamed for what he did. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Remember, this is Peter. Peter that had that vision of the great sheep let down from heaven. And God is telling him, kill him, eat. He's like, whoa, I've never eaten stuff like that in my life. What I have called clean, don't you call unclean. And Peter understood that he was to go with these Gentile inquirers that came to his door right after that vision. This is that Peter who went and rejoiced and was amazed that the Gentiles came to the Lord. And so he went down with Paul and he was eating with these Gentiles until, until... And so a group came down that were strong on the circumcision and really pushing it. And at that point, he drew back and separated himself because he was afraid of them, afraid of what they'd say, what they'd think. Mm. How do you think those Gentile believers felt? Mm. Yesterday you were here at the mm. table with us, and now you're, <laughs> you're not even talking to us. You're way over there. I mean, how harmful mm. is that? You know? And it says the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. I mean, this is like Jewish background people. Acted the same way along with them. So that even Barnabas, Barnabas, the great encourager, that was his heart. Anybody that was around him, he wanted to encourage. And yet these Gentile believers, because of fear of what people might say, he backed off. 
-hmm. Even he was led astray because Peter is a leader. Mm -hmm. And so Paul addresses the leader in front of everybody because this was not a private sin. Mm -hmm. This was a very public sin with very public hurts. Mm -hmm. And he said to them before everybody, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, and I'm sure that made the circumcision part of the move, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how, and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? What are you doing, Peter? Mm -hmm. And even though it's not recorded here, I think Peter took that greatly to heart. Mm -hmm. Peter who wept bitterly over, you know, rejecting her, denying the Lord, I think, but bitterly again over hurting the Lord's people. And we know that he encouraged Gentiles in other places. But Paul was coming there to correct some wrongs in the song. He wasn't afraid to tackle even a fellow pillar of the church, if you will. So yeah, he, he was very concerned that they believed the right thing about the gospel. He rightly divided the word of truth. So, uh, for next week, we're going to go to Ephesians. And so you, you can just see there, uh, we have a, another marking printout. And uh, you, can, you can read the background material either in Know Your Bible and in your own study Bibles on Ephesians to prepare for that. Yes, ma'am. On the Galatian sheet, the yes. second dot, yes. the second line, I missed. Oh, I, maybe I can do it. The curse. The second dot is to warn of the consequences of preaching the curse of God. Thank you. That's the consequence. And thank you for talking about that. I forget to put on the dots. And that reminds me, before we get to the last book, I had asked you in the first week to bring your copies of um, the review of the New Testament, uh, one on John, one on Romans, the first Corinthians. I thought, let's just go through that quickly, just to kind of see how the flow is going. And I started with John, because of all, of all four of the Gospels, this is one that is the Gospel, if you will, because he just flat out says, the whole reason I'm writing this book is so that you will believe and receive eternal life. You know, it was just gospel through and through. Um, and so then that brought us to Romans. And in Romans, Paul was clearly going deep into the implications of the gospel, explaining what it is and how it's spelled out, how it's lived out. Um, just a great doctrinal book about the gospel. Mm -hmm. And then that brought us to 1 Corinthians. And I had that one because it kind of gives a summary of all the books up to the point of where we are now. Okay, in Matthew, we're told that the promised deliverer and king has come. In Mark, we said, oh yeah, he's come. He's the king, but he's not going to reign yet. He came to serve, and he wants us to serve too. And Luke says, he's one of us. He's human. He understands how hard it is to serve. And John says, hey, but he's also God, so he can enable us to do God's will, which is, in Acts, going all the world. First in your immediate surroundings, Jerusalem, and then a little farther afield, Judea and all of Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. And Romans spells out what that message is that we take. And then we come to 1 Corinthians. Oops. We're getting a little off track here. We've got some problems we've got to deal with before we can get back to the main business. And 2 Corinthians kind of adds to that. And then that brought us to Galatians. And we're just defending that gospel with all these words. So now we're going to see a beautiful application of the gospel um, next week in Ephesians. All right. And with that, I think we will. Now go to the blessed book, chapter 2. Chapter 2, he opened up with a statement, or it's not even a complete sentence, it's just a phrase. Uh, blessers versus converters. What does that mean? 
What's the blesser? What's the converter? The converter is like someone with a scoreboard. <laughs> check off like their success is fully measured in. Um, Wouldn't that be the Holy Spirit? Well, yes. <laughs> yes. yes, the Holy Spirit but is the converter. Yes. Or what people try to be. I mean, I guess that's what's kind yeah. of. We're not like, supposed to be the converters, though, are we? No, well, that's the Holy Spirit's job. But okay, but some people do have that as their goal. You know, they hope to convert a lot of people. And it's not just, I think these are well intentioned people. Mm -hmm. And they may even understand that concept that it's actually the Holy Spirit. But still, that is their goal. How many people can we bring to the Lord? That sounds much better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's a blesser? Somebody who prays for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Jesus' hands and feet and allowing God to change hearts. Okay. Bring it for the long haul and friendships and sticking with that person and being able to listen really good and not just <coughs> jump in and tell them what you need to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if you're a, if you have that mentality, I'm a bluster, what you're looking for, how can I help mm -hmm. this person? How can I be an encouragement? Mm -hmm. How can I be a help? You know, if it's conversion, you're you know, if you haven't brought them to the Lord, you have failed. You know, so okay, that was the concept in that phrase, and that was a whole other doctrinal dissertation of one of his friends. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting. There's two groups of missionaries, real missionaries, in Thailand, and one uh, one group was went there with the idea we're just going to bless in any way that we can, and the other group went we want to bring as many people as we can to the Lord. You know. And at the end of two years, or however long it was, I think it was two years, the converters had precisely one convert. Mm -hmm. The other group had something like 48. Mm -hmm. But it also impacted the community in a variety mm -hmm. of ways. Mm -hmm. And remember, this was being shared with Dave Ferguson. Fail. Fail, fail, yeah. tried the Billy Graham thing, fail, mm -hmm. tried just living it, fail, you know. Hitchhiker. Yeah, <laughs> the hitchhiker, fail. <laughs> so he's got a heart, he wants so much to be doing God's work in God's way. He's failed at it so many ways. This sounds really promising. Mm -hmm. Blessing versus converting. But I, what struck me about these two brothers is the wise way they went about what they did. Mm -hmm. Because what did they do? Um, the very first thing they did, you find this on page 18 and 19, mm -hmm. um, down at the bottom of page 18, and right under blessing strategy, I shared that study on blessing versus converting with my brother John, and we were so compelled by this, so intrigued by it, is this really the real deal, that we both started to research scripture mm -hmm. to discover more about this strategy. Is this really what God has for all people at all time? You know, God did tell Abraham, I will bless you, and so on and so on. He also told him to be circumcised. That was not for all people for all time. Is blessing for all people for all time? They wanted to know, and they started searching scripture. And I thought, ladies, this is where we always should begin. And I'll just share with you just briefly, you know, last Sunday, if you were here at our church, my husband preached, and it happened to be our anniversary. Was that so? And so he preached on marriage. But we met in our 40s. When I was 22, I was a senior at Cedarville College, I really wanted to be called to be a missionary. It seemed like everybody was called to be something or other. I never got what call, 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 call. And I just prayed, God, call me during this missions conference. And he did. You know what he spoke to me about? He spoke to me very clearly, my will for your life is that you be single. Yeah, wow. Well, mm -hmm. I got, uh, <laughs> I don't think I can handle that. And when mm -hmm. I'm 22, the people on both sides of my parents live to be in their 80s and 90s. Can I really be 
for that long all by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and he made it very clear, um, it was sort of like by the end of the week, he was saying, well, can you be single for five more minutes? Like, well, yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> irritated, you know, of course. Well, how about another day? Mm -hmm. How about another week? You don't get your wife in 70 year chunks. Mm -hmm. You get it now by now by now by now by now. Mm -hmm. And so I was single. But it came with the force of a calling. Mm -hmm. I had prayed to be called. And this mm -hmm. is the message I got. So for 22 years, I was single. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't want to be married. I felt guilty because I still wanted to be married, you know? I thought, that isn't for me. God's made that very clear, you know? Why am I still feeling this way sometimes? Anyway, so I'm going about the business that God gave me. I'm teaching on the mission field, loving it, you know? Enter one Tom Sartor. For the first month or two, I thought he was a very pleasant young man, you know? And the more I saw, the more I admired, and then I realized I'm falling in love with this guy. And this is a problem because he isn't a short term. It's going to go away if I can just tough it out for a year. <laughs> He's going to be here year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And if this isn't resolved, it could disrupt two ministries. You know? So I thought, okay, this is bigger than me. I need some help. I need some counseling. But who do you go to with something like that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And, um, I found out it was my roommate. I finally shared with her. I said, I just laid it all out. You know, my call and these feelings. And I just said, would you please pray that God would make me content to be single? And she says, yeah, I will. But, she says, Edie, if it's God's will for you to be married now, you need to be open to that. Do you mind if I pray that if it's God's will, you be married? I said, no. <laughs> Go for it. And then she left me alone. You know, she didn't try to keep bugging me. How's it going? How's it going? She just let me be. And so that's what I did. I started looking through scripture. I read all the love stories I could think of to see what principles I could glean. Like from Adam and Eve, I learned that God created the woman to meet a need in the man's life, and he brought her to him. And what for me, that was very freeing because um, I had been trying to manipulate things. And this is like, take your hands off. This is God. Ladies, I, I will tell you. I will just embarrass myself and tell you. Um, <laughs> I was working at our main office and Tom happened to drop in and I saw him as I was leaving. And I, oh, and so I said, hi Tom. He didn't hear me. So I went out the door and I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> I went around and came into another door. <laughs> <laughs> I went out Again, I said, hi, Tom. He still didn't hear me. <laughs> I thought, okay. I thought, he was right. really deep in thought, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. Well, he was deep. If you know my husband, when he's talking with somebody, he's focused on that person. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I went out to the to the gate. Well, the gate was a great big gate to keep out cars because there was a personnel door in it. So I just stepped through the door to see if there was a taxi there. And there wasn't, so I stepped back in. Well, what I didn't realize, Tom had come up behind me. So I backed <laughs> right into him. He says, excuse me, and I said, you're welcome. <laughs> I mean, just totally, you know. So it was so freeing to realize, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. God, if this is God, go work out. And then, so the second story I read was, you know, Ruth and Boaz, that's always a great story. But what I saw there was, it's okay to be attractive. And the mother-in-law said, you know, dress up in your best clothes. But she also said, it's up to the man to do what he will. You wait and see. You know, just rest at home and see what Boaz, how he reacts to you. And I thought, okay, I just need to wait. Because I had no clue that Tom felt the same way or not, you know. And so then the next thing I read intentionally was um, Proverbs 31. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, um, Let's just take a fresh look at this woman, you know, mm -hmm. so I can be, I need to be the woman that I am. Mm -hmm. And if that's what Tom needs, great, you know. And what struck me there, there was where the Lord was able to lead me. 
at the end of that, at the version I was reading, it says, the woman that fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward that she has earned. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit just said, Edie, you have been single for 22 years because I asked you to. Now you're free. You can be married. But then I had to wait. And that was the hard part, you know, the waiting, the waiting. It seemed so easy and brief. But anyway, any kind of life question we have, whether it's marriage or whether it's how do you, how do you go about God's business, I think they were so wise. You search the scripture mm -hmm. to find principles that you can use. The next thing they did was equally important, and I think equally good. They searched the life of Christ. Because they thought, if this is a universal principle, Christ is the perfect man, we should see it lived out in his life. Mm -hmm. And so they went through, they said, we took a look at the life of Christ. Thought, this is more than a look. <laughs> this is a big study. They've gone through and you know, really analyzed. And they said they made a list of practices that he routinely did. And then I thought they had more wisdom because they didn't tell you all 50 things or how many it was that they found. You know, if I told you, here's 50 things you can do, you'll probably think, oh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and turn around and walk away, because who can keep 50 in mind, yeah. you know? But they looked through all the things that they had researched and talked about them, and they chose the top five. They were looking for things that they thought that normal, everyday people could do in their normal, everyday lives mm -hmm. to impact people around them. They chose the top five. Five we can kind of handle. And then they put them into an acrostic, the blessed acrostic. But I want you to realize they didn't start with an acrostic that sounded cool and then force things into it. Like, okay, let's use bless because, you know, God blessed Abraham and that seems to be the principle. What can be, um, build relationship, that's part of it. Um, L, love one another. We're told to love one another, right? Mm -hmm. Problem is, bless is kind of warm and fuzzy, you mm -hmm. know, what do you do to bless? Mm -hmm. Build relationships is kind of like that, and love one another is kind of like that. They didn't do that. They found those five, top five practices that they got people to mm -hmm. actually do, and they made them into simple verbs. Mm -hmm. Specific things you can do. Begin with prayer. We sort of know how to pray. You know, and if we don't know, we have the Holy Spirit to help mm -hmm. us and to teach us what to ask for. But sometimes we don't know what to ask for. Um, and then the L was to listen. We all have ears, and we can, if we aren't normally skilled at that, we can ask God to help us become more skilled at that. That is a specific thing we can do to a person to show, I'm interested in you. I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to actually listen and hear what you have to say. You know? And then the third one, eat. We all love to eat. Mm -hmm. What better place to listen than over, the, over a cup of coffee or a cup of tea mm -hmm. or cookies or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? Eat with people. And we see Christ doing that all the time. Mm -hmm. you know? Zacchaeus, mm -hmm. I'm going to eat with you today. Mm -hmm. Did that ever strike you as kind of a bold kind of mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. to do? And then I said that was kind of a cultural It is. I'm going to show my friendship. That I want exactly. To our Bangladeshi friends, you know, from our Western culture, we always try to make sure we didn't just drop in at mealtime. Yeah. We try to make appointments or whatever you want. But one time I just happened to drop in, they were thrilled. They went on and on mm -hmm. about it. You didn't ask ahead of time, you just came. You know, whoa. So yeah, this is a way of showing friendship, helping, to be a blesser. How can we be of assistance? How can we meet a need somewhere? Or when we actually study that, you're going to see another way to do it is allow somebody else to serve us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's easier for us to do than to be on the receiving end. But like when my husband and I had that um, chimney re redoing project and one of our neighbors came over and gave us three days of his life <laughs> to help us, that was wonderful. <clears throat> and it helped build that relationship. We were thrilled to have him there. Let people serve you you serve them because either way it's flowing it's building mm -hmm. it's knitting together mm -hmm. from heart and then the last one was share sharing the story 
Some of us are very good at that, very bold at that. Some of us are shy at that. And we'll be learning some things, hopefully, that will help us with that. But after you've become a friend, it's a lot easier mm -hmm. to share. I think sometimes some of us try to move that sto our story up at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like, we start with the listening, and then we jump right in with, instead mm -hmm. of working through those other steps for, right. for okay, I find myself guilty of that yeah. sometimes. You too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just something that we can all be sharpening our skills. We can be iron sharpening iron and helping each other. Yeah. That, like I said, I just was, I just thought they had so much um, wisdom. And then how he began it in his own life. Um, let's see, there's that. Okay, this is over on page 28. Okay, so he's convinced this is the real deal. It stands to test the scripture. And, I see Christ living it out in a lot of ways, and uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start. But I thought again, he was wise. He started small, and he built in accountability. Mm -hmm. So he's in the middle of the page there. He says, "I decided I'd make two commitments. Just two. One is I'm going to use one of those practices every day. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's prayer." Mm -hmm. Maybe one day I ate with somebody. Maybe one day somebody called me on the phone and I was listening for half an hour. You know, but I'm going to make sure I do at least one every day. Mm -hmm. And he actually kept a journal. Mm -hmm. that he wrote down. And then, for accountability, I asked my small group to ask me, who did mm -hmm. you bless this week? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, again, he's wise because, you know, you get busy and you forget. Mm -hmm. and, oh, <coughs> ah! <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so... I'm going to do it, and I'm going to have people check on me to make sure I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And so then he tells the story of Michael. What was your reaction? What are some things that struck you as you read this account with his friend Michael? Two and a half years before a yes. spiritual conversation. It took a long time. Yes, and I thought hopefully this isn't the only person he's seeking to bless, and hopefully God gave him some fruit. Others, <laughs> others, you know, to keep him. Moving, you know, but I, that struck me too. Yeah. Two and a half years, mm -hmm. and seemingly nothing spiritual. Certainly a relationship, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Anything else that struck you, Preston? Just their common love. They had something in common that they could um, start with. Right, and it wasn't necessarily a spiritual thing. No. It's just cross no. country, but yeah. you know, you like football, good. Yeah. You know, you like yeah. this, you like that, yeah. you like quilting. Yeah. You can use the quilting group. Yeah. As a <laughs> and his friend reached out to him. I mean, during one cross country meeting, Michael said <coughs> to me, hey, I'd like for us to talk to him. Obviously, he had made an impact. Because if this guy was ready to talk and knew he was ready to talk about something that was weighing heavily on him, yeah. he thought of this person as a good friend, as yes. someone who cared about him. Mm -hmm. Yes, they had built the trust. Mm -hmm. You don't share this kind of thing mm -hmm. to just anybody. Mm -hmm. I think he realized other people had the same problem and they were willing to listen and not, you know, give opinions or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he discovered at the small group, mm -hmm. you know, was that here was another couple. And they spoke first, which I think, again, that was God making mm -hmm. him feel more free then to share his hurt. I mean, mm -hmm. a very real yes. hurt. I mean, to have a daughter murdered, you know, how oh, horrible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I something that uh, he said on Dave said on top of page twenty nine, we're talking about that two and a half years. He said, "I believe that my prayers over those two and a half years did two things. First of all, it allowed God's Spirit to work in my heart to grow my compassion for Michael and create an opportunity. In other words, these are two years." I'm being a true friend to him that's creating trust. Mm -hmm. so that when the moment comes, mm -hmm. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And then also during that time, God's Spirit was at work in my friend to help him realize he's stuck mm -hmm. in an impossible situation. He's trying to live two lives. And we could tell him, Dave could have helped him, I don't work, but he had to come to that realization himself. Mm -hmm. I'm in a dance. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't do anymore. 
And then, in that two and a half years, guess what was happening? Right at that time, the small group that Dave is leading, or hosting, is beginning a study called Starting Over. And even though it didn't say specifically, I think it means starting over from something to regret. I'm sorry, that's okay. I'm trying to shut it off anymore. <laughs> It won't cooperate. It won't turn off. Oh, <laughs> machines, you love them, you hate oh. them. Drives me crazy. So I thought, again, you know, he, Dave wasn't aware that God was doing all this, but everything was being mm -hmm. put in the perfect place mm -hmm. at the perfect time. So when Michael's heart was ready, they were doing exactly the study that he needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And the people, and then God kept away everybody, but just mm -hmm. one other couple. Mm -hmm. He kept yes. the comfort level down. Yeah. You know, just you just see God, and I thought, wow, mm -hmm. you can hardly wait to see these mm -hmm. kind of God moments, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and to keep up that prayer, mm -hmm. that prayer, mm -hmm. the listening, mm -hmm. the eating. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just thought it was very encouraging, but mm -hmm. very wise yeah. that he had a small commitment, but it paid huge dividends because mm -hmm. he was faithful right. to it. So. Um, any other thoughts from this chapter? <laughs> All right, so for next week, we will go on to the third chapter um, in this book and Ephesians. So next week, we're going to begin with prayer. We'll actually get into the steps and learn more about that. Mm -hmm. I guess we do have a few minutes. I just, uh, I'll go back. I thought there were the boxes. We'll just look at the boxes in this chapter because I think they're helpful. First one's on page 18. You pick your primary context. In other words, as you're working through this, you should have some people in mind, maybe, that God is laying on your heart. Mm -hmm. And I like the way they said, um, you know, how, you know, where are you going to apply these things? If you're tempted to say all of the above, mm -hmm. I'm going to trust this group and this group and this group, wrong. That's the wrong answer. Um, you're not God. God can bless the world. You can bless the finite number of people that are in some given context. And even Christ himself. How many disciples did he have? Twelve. Twelve. I mean, he had lots of people who were sort of disciples and followed him. But he had twelve that he invested his time and effort in teaching in. Limit yourself. You know, pick few. Um, two ways to keep these practices from being effective. First is just not doing them. Well, mm -hmm. that's a real killer. <laughs> <laughs> and the second is trying to do them in too many places. Mm -hmm. So pick a context, limit your audience. You know. Okay, and then the next one is on page 20, that it's not a checklist. Okay, I prayed for you, I listened to you, I did you, you da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, people feel like projects mm -hmm. and not people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's good. Never focus more on the practices than on the people who are seeking the blessings. So again, I just like little nuggets of wisdom mm -hmm. throughout here. Mm -hmm. Very practical things, very real things. Mm -hmm. so. so what happens if you've already messed up with a person? Um, I think God a, is bigger than our message, right? Mm -hmm. We can always start over. We can start always, over. from now, be a friend. Be a blessing mm -hmm. in as many ways as you can. If there's anything you need to say, hey, you know, forgive me for, you know, if there was some fault, confess that and then go on. But start over mm -hmm. and keep on. Keep praying. Two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Our that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm.